All right, hello, my name is Hodge Flemings and I'm the founder of Rebrand Cities and I would like to welcome you to Beyond Diversity Summit. So I'm excited, today's panel that we have is gonna be an amazing panel. We have speakers from a variety of different cities and a variety of different, of different verticals. So the title of this panel is called How to Create More Diverse and Inclusive Cities of the Future. We know, but you know, so we know by the year 2050 that 70% of the population is going to live in urban cities. So we're going to have some interesting conversations and some very, very um, cool perspectives. But what I want to do is I want to be able to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, we have uh, a tremendous amount of intellectual capital and people who are doing amazing work. So what we're going to do is we're going to go one by one. Their pictures is going to come up and we're going to allow them to give you a little more insight into who they are. First, I would like to introduce Courtney Harding from Friends with Holograms. Hi. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's such a fun way to end the week and get to chat with everyone. So I'm Courtney. I run a VR and AR agency called Friends with Holograms. We are a social impact virtual reality agency. So we really focus on a lot of training, enterprise work, but we're also really interested in how do you use VR to visualize the cities of the future. So what does a city look like in 10 years and a city that is welcoming to all, safe for all, prosperous for all? So yeah, I'm curious to see how other people are using technology to envision and build the cities of the future. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you very much. Next, we have Janice Lentz, and she is a hearing access consultant. Hi. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So I help to make the world accessible for people with hearing loss. And I work with corporations, government agencies, cultural institutions to remove the artificial barriers that prevent people with hearing loss from enjoying the facilities. And I've worked on projects ranging from the New York City subway information booths, New York City taxis, the National Park Service, to museums across the country, and even globally, um, working in Greece, Ecuador, Nigeria, uh, England, Switzerland, and that's my goal. Wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. Um, and I know the work that you do is really, really trans transformational. Next, we have Leanne Buchanan uh, from Venture Cafe Miami. Hi, everybody, Welcome. and so much for inviting me to have uh, this conversation and be part of what an amazing panel. Um, I'm a writer, strategist, and I focus on community facilitation. What I really like to do um, in my work with Venture Cafe and other projects that I lead is to support leaders and ecosystems bridge gaps in access, inclusion, opportunity, and racial um, and equity around tech innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, Venture Cafe has been working in Miami to really collaborate with other organizations. So in the last five years, we've been able to serve 50,000 innovators and partner with about a thousand organizations. And that work is really grounded in creating relationships, trust, strategic priorities, and looking at how we design for the folks that may not always be at the table and in the rooms of decision and influence. So super excited to be part of this conversation. All right, glad to have you, glad to have you. Next, we have Felicia Hatcher. She is the co-founder of the Center for Black Innovation. Welcome. Hey, everyone. I'm excited about being a part of this conversation as, as well. I'm one of the co-founders and executive director of the Center for Black Innovation. Uh, we are a black innovation ecosystem building organization and a think tank uh, with the understanding that smart cities and communities are formed by cultivating great leaders, entrepreneurs, and real capital pathways so that uh, that value black culture and communities as our greatest assets. Um, some of our partners include the Knight Foundation, NBC Universal, Samsung Next, uh, Cerna, and, and others. And um, we put on the Black Tech Week conference and, and support entrepreneurs here in South Florida and then um, in, in nine other cities across the United States. So I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. All right, welcome, welcome. Next we have, and last but not least, Stephen Green. Uh, and he calls himself the Black Latino Guy. So Stephen, welcome. <laughs> hey, uh, happy to be here. Always nice to see uh, folks like Hodge and Felicia. Um, huge, huge fans of your work. Um, Felicia Portland misses you. Uh, I'm here in Portland, Oregon. I'm a CEO of a kids book about, we're, we're a company that's black owned here and we help parents and adults navigate tough conversations with kids. Um, we do that by bringing 
authors to bear that historically are left out of, of publishing. Um, of the 40 books that we've done so far, 14 of those have been written by black authors. Uh, and in my, my, my time away from work, uh, I love championing uh, black founders and helping them start, scale, and grow, grow their businesses. Uh, I founded an event called Pitch Black where we, we go around the country introducing ecosystems to black entrepreneurs uh, and helping them raise capital for their businesses. So happy to be part of this conversation. Looking forward to it. All right. All right. Well, well, I'm glad we were able to get through um, all the introduction. We have an amazing panel. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to kind of set the stage. So so when we start talking about cities being diverse and being inclusive, um, that can take on a variety of different of different angles and dimensions. And so what I'd like to do is, um, is I would love to be able to hear from a few of our panelists in terms of being able to kind of stage like this conversation. Because as I think about diversity, I think beyond just race. I, I start to think about equity and other things that are really, really, really important in terms of creating cities that are places for all people. So what I like to do is just kind of open it up um, and um, let our panelists kind of chime in in terms of um, how, how you would kind of um, frame what a diverse or inclusive city really looks like or means. I'm happy to jump in. Um, so since I'm the only person representing people with disabilities, which tends to be left off the table in a lot of these conversations. And I always try to remind people that the D in diversity stands for disability. And so it's really important to build in the access right as cities are renovating or building um, up a certain area. So for example, when a new museum is opening, adding the access from the beginning. And so many times, a lot of places will retain consultants who say they can handle all the disabilities. And what they really mean is they can handle physical access and hearing access is an afterthought. And so for people with hearing loss, that's really troubling because they're not at the table as, as you said. And there really needs to be, as this um, symbol just showed, a three-prong approach for the full spectrum of people with hearing loss. And so many places, whether it's corporations, museums, or government agencies, view access for people with hearing loss as a menu where you get to pick and choose. And a lot of times they will just add, offer captioning, leaving out the auditory to bring the sound to a person's ears, similar to what's in the subway information booths called like an induction loop. And they don't think it matters. And as I always explain, and I think this will be relevant to, to the group, where you know the same way going on a bus is about being from point A to B, or so people thought, but it does matter where you sit on the bus. And it does matter how you receive the information. And you don't want someone telling you where to sit on the bus, and you don't want someone telling you how to receive information. And if the sound isn't important for people with hearing loss, then places should shut the sound for everyone, which is never acceptable. And so it's really important to bring stakeholders to the table, not just the generic concept. I know that's a rather long answer, but it's it's something that's, I think, very misunderstood for people with disabilities. They view it as an umbrella, as, oh, you handle disabilities, you can handle everything. Yeah, what I love about that is that, um, is that, is that if there's, if something is not an issue for a specific person, we took, we, we tend to have blind spots. And so, and so I think that's a great point that most of us who don't have to deal with that probably haven't, um, haven't kind of thought about that. All right, I'd like to throw it over to Leanne um, and kind of get her thoughts. I knew you were coming for me, Haj. Well, <laughs> so when I think about this question, I like to um, say diversity is often where we lead with. And so I think at this point where we are in society, we all agree that diversity is what we need to establish as our ground floor. Um, but I also think that communities, cities, ecosystems, they don't come out of thin air. And so I always like to say that air is a great acronym for access, inclusion, and race and equity. And so when you're looking at what this looks like in practice, we need to intentionally design for access to resources, access to capital, inclusion meaning more than just inclusive experiences, but really a sense of belonging and inclusive access to those places of power and influence. Racial representation. I know that recently the White House, the new White House just issued an executive order elevating racial equity and service to underrepresented um, communities as a priority under this new administration. 
And finally, equity, being that we have equal access to opportunities, that this idea that the races that we run require us to have different starting blocks because we don't all start from the same place. So ensuring that we're making sure that everybody has that equitable trajectory to achieve the same opportunity as everybody else. And those are kind of the practical considerations that I think about in terms of communities. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. So, so we're on the heels of of a brand new administration. We just had an election, um, and so I would I would love as we as we start to level set things. I would love to get people. I don't want to turn this into a political panel, but I would love to be able to hear people's thoughts in terms of like how they how they view the world today based upon everything that's going on in the United States. And I'll kind of just open it up. Um, so Courtney, I don't know whether you want to jump in on that one or not. Yeah, wow. I mean, that's a that's a huge question. So I think that, you know, the, the feeling for me for the last two days has just been this sense of relief now that things have changed, now that there's not the sense of like impending doom hanging over my head every day. So now it becomes, once that feeling has worn off, and I'm sure it will, it becomes a sense of like, how do we build back better, right? That's something that they've been talking about a lot in this new administration. And one thing that I think virtual reality has an incredible amount of power to do is to allow people to actually live in, even if it's just virtually and even if it's just for a short period of time, these new spaces that we can right now only conceptualize. Because it's very hard to think like, what does the city of the future that is welcoming and inclusive for all look like? But if we can actually build that and allow people to experience it, even if it's just for a short period of time, that's actually incredibly powerful. Like I've lived in cities my entire life. I live in Brooklyn. I lived in Portland, actually. I grew up there. And I love those cities, but I never felt fully safe there. Like I'd go jogging at 6 a.m. and I'd always be looking over my shoulder and it would just be the sense of like, okay, I have to watch out. And I went to Japan a few years ago, which is an incredibly safe place. Um, and I went for a run in Japan and I was just like, oh, I don't have to look over my shoulder right now. I can just run and be free. And that was a huge moment for me of like, oh, this is what this is actually like. And I think not everyone has can go to Japan, especially right now. But the idea is how can we introduce people to the concept that other worlds are possible? And I think that's where VR can really be of a service as we build back better. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So I think we all have like different experiences, you know, in terms of how we feel safe and what cities mean to us. So I'm really interested in how do we create cities that are for all people though? What are some of the things that we think are gonna be really, really important? So I would love to be able to hear, um, and it might be a specific story or things that you have experienced or worked on or things like that, but I'd love to be able to hear something from some of our other panelists as well. I think you have to have people at this table. I mean, yeah, you, can, yeah. you cannot yeah. have people, you cannot discuss what is right for people unless they're at the table, right? Nobody wants someone telling them what they think. It would be inappropriate for me to tell you what your experience is, right? And what it was like growing up to be you. I couldn't do that. It's the same for people with disabilities. You can't even enter the room if the access isn't in place. So if the hearing access isn't there and you can't hear the question, you can't answer. So it's building that in right from the start. I mean, I am very confident with President Biden. President Biden on his own edited it when he was the vice president to his house. After reading an article where I was quoted among other people in the Washington Post, that's a proactive person. So I am very confident in his understanding this. But when we have ferries in New York City where they don't add the access because they just decide not to, right? And this is on new boats. Why, how can someone take a ferry and feel comfortable and feel safe, God forbid, in an emergency or know which stop to get off? H how does the city do that? So um, critical as I am of the, of the New York City mayor, that it begins with actually having people, but there is a, a disability division, but it's somebody using a wheelchair and he's making decisions for people with hearing loss. That's just not appropriate because he doesn't know anything about it. And he doesn't even make an effort to grow or to edu or to understand it. So ha having those people in the room who can educate the, the decision makers is critical. Absolutely, absolutely. I think ish, um, I think access is definitely um, a very, very important topic. So I'd like to ping over to um, to Felicia. I know you've dealt with 
a lot of situations where you are creating access for entrepreneurs in the Miami area. So I'd love to be able to hear some things that you have been working on as well. Yeah, um, I, I'd actually love to comment on the last question. That oh, okay, cool. Yep, yep. Um, just kind of thinking of like this new political landscape and specifically for those that um, serve communities that have largely been uh, affected and attacked in the last administration, right? I think prior to that, so much of the conversation was that we were in this post-racial society under President Obama and under President Trump, we saw that we definitely were not. And so in some ways I can unfortunately give that administration credit as to exposing just how big the problem was and is and will continue and continue to be, right? So there's there's that one, that, that part. Um, all of this around what cities need to do is really about one, all of us in our lived experience and what does that mean? And then cities really being intentional about creating safe spaces. And then as they're thinking about resources, always trusting the people that they are intending to serve, like trust them to be able to also solve their own problems and sometimes get out of the way, right? And so when we think about the resources that that we need, uh, you know, I, I was on, uh, Leanne has been on a, a listening tour. Um, I would love to see more people that are in charge of affecting change or essentially kind of giving up resources to do more of that, more listening about what is needed so that we're building the things that truly can support people. And so that's largely what we've done over the past six years, starting out as Code Fever, um, running Black Tech Week um, as a way to create kind of like a magnetic force of people to come to Miami, uh, value Miami, contribute to the space and what we're doing before they extract the resources that they need, especially when we're talking about um, entrepreneurship, um, young people and tech professionals is, is about creating those spaces where innovation can thrive in neighborhoods that we largely feel that innovation does not happen, but we see it happen every single day. It's just under-resourced and undervalued. That's very powerful. And I love what you said about like lived, you know what I'm saying, about like lived experience. Cause I think that we all bring our own um, our own worldview, like to the table. And I think it's important to be able to bring those experiences, to be able to share those because those can be very powerful in terms of helping other people, right? So, Absolutely. yep, yep. So I like to do, um, I know we haven't heard from Stephen yet. Um, and so Stephen is from Portland and I know Portland um, historically um, has been, uh, I, I guess for lack of a better, a better word, very polarizing from a race standpoint. So I'm, I would be, I'd be very curious to hear from you in terms of, in terms of like this conversation as it relates back to a city like Portland in terms of how they're moving forward and doing interesting things to, to create a more inclusive environment there. Yeah, thanks Aj. Um, and I know, you know, with Courtney being from here and, and Felicia living here as well, I'm sure they have some perspectives on Portland. Um, I, I think one of the things about Portland to understand is, yes, from a macro perspective, we are the widest big city in the country. Um, but if you stop there, you, you miss out on a lot of nuance and granularity. Um, and, and, and from my standpoint, it's just a wonderful city. So one of the things I understand about Portland as well is we are one of the least um, segregated cities in, in the country. And so you can go anywhere in the city and, and see black folks, see black businesses, um, downtown, rural. Uh, I, I know a few black farmers around here that, that make wine and hazelnuts. Um, and, and we have such a diversity of black experiences that the only other place I've lived is Detroit, which is still to this day, the most segregated city in the country, um, where there's, there's literally, you know, eight mile and, and, and things where you stop seeing black people be represented. And so the other thing is there's a generational divide. So here in Portland, though, overall, 24% uh, of, the, of the city are, are people of color. Um, when you go and you start looking at generational divide, when you go under the age of 21, we're a predominantly POC city. Um, and so change is happening. Um, people are moving around. Uh, one of the big things that, that's changed uh, in the last 20, 30 years was illegal real estate practices that that forced 80% um, of the state's black population to live in two census tracts. Follow with me on that. So two census mm -hmm. tracts had 80, or I'm sorry, zip codes, had 80% of the state's entire black population living in them because people couldn't live anywhere else. Uh, realtors wouldn't take their phone calls. 
um, deeds on, on homes said that black people couldn't own them. And that really started to, to loosen and stop in the, in the 90s going into the early 2000s. And so now you have black people living all over the, uh, all, all over the, the region. Um, but I, I live in a historically black part of town and the, the percentage of black people here has probably dropped 50%. And so for folks that their perspective is only living in this part of town, they would be led to think, you know, black people are leaving Portland. Um, but what they don't get to see is they don't get to go to the other side of town where there's never really been any black people and there's people popping up in, in neighborhoods over there left and right. And so perspective is such a, a big piece of this. Um, and, and I love what Leanne said about access. Access is such a big part of this. Like you can have us in large macro numbers, but if we don't have access, um, then, then we're missing out on the opportunities that we need to, to really, um, from my standpoint, focusing on, on closing the wealth gap. Absolutely, absolutely. So what I love to kind of like shift a little bit to is I love to hear some positive stories. And so and so from our panelists, I love to be able to hear some positive stories because I know that there's always an opportunity for us to be able to look at stuff from a negative standpoint or look at it from one angle. But I know that there's some amazing positive stories about great things that are happening in the cities that you're in or things that you're a part of. And so I kind of just kind of just throw it out to just, you know, as so a I actually work. have something yes. that's related to Portland and it's actually it's related to the suburbs of Portland and Stephen, it actually kind of tags on nicely with what you're talking about, which is like, I, I can guess where you live in Portland because I lived in, um, when I lived in Portland after college, I lived in a neighborhood that had been historically black and gentrified and um, a lot of uh, people who had lived in the neighborhood for a long time left, they got priced out, it was awful. But what's interesting about Portland is a lot of the other neighborhoods, and particularly the suburbs, have become much more diverse, right? So, you know, where I grew up sort of on the outskirts of Portland was like incredibly white, incredibly homogenous in the 90s when I was a kid. And then I came back to visit recently and where my parents lived, this sort of just middle class suburb was so much more diverse. And what was fantastic about it was there didn't seem to be that much friction. It seemed to be very sort of seamless and um, you know, obviously there are, there are issues as there always are, but it was really interesting to sort of see like the transition to sort of the suburban neighborhoods. And I think that's a really interesting thing to look about as we think about the cities of the future is these cities will contain, will have suburbs attached to them. Right. And how do we also make sure that the suburbs and these sort of outlying neighborhoods are also diverse and inclusive and welcoming and not just focus on the city center. Absolutely. I have, I yep. have a good story as well, um, which is amazing. I love what Courtney said because I, I completely agree with that. Delta is doing amazing things for people with hearing loss. When you go to renovated airports, you will see um, hearing access, the induction loops, at multiple new airports. So, if you're talking about Detroit, it's in Detroit, it's in Rochester, it's in um, the new, new uh, JFK. It's in multiple places around the country. And what's really fabulous about not only the hearing access in an airport and the obvious of letting people be, be uh, for people to be able to hear in the airport, what it is doing is it's creating a best practice model so that once the access is in an airport, it's like, for example, in Detroit, it's really easy to be able to point to the airport as a model of excellence for government agencies, for museums, cultural institutions, so that it has um, a domino effect and creates um, change in other cities. And that is really exciting. And if more corporations had would do that, and we have more corporations doing that, the spillover effect would be huge. And it's really phenomenal what Delta did. And the other project that they did was they added captions to in-flight entertainment so that they were fo they followed Virgin Atlantic and now other um, airlines are doing that. And again, that has a spillover effect into cities because when people are arriving, it's the first thing they see when they come to the United States. And that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it kind of like gets us thinking about like technology, right? So I know you're talking about like, make sure that the access like we're hearing impaired. Um, I know, I know, you know, like the VR angle. 
I'm also interested in terms of the positive or negative impact that technology or the lack of equitable technology in different spaces also plays. So Wi-Fi and things like that. So I would love to be able to hear some thoughts as it relates back to that because I've seen that play out in a variety of different ways. And um, and so I would love to be able to get that on the table so we can start to spark, spark some of that conversation. One thing that, that um, we've talked about, Haj, and we've partnered on is the disconnect that often exists in communities between startups and tech startups and small businesses. And we saw um, during the pandemic that at least, I think it was 41% of black owned small businesses failed. And one of the reasons why a lot of small businesses failed is because they were not yet tech enabled, right? If you didn't have a website, and I know that you have this goal of getting 10,000 small businesses online, but even if you're an F&B or you're in products, if you don't have e-commerce, if you don't have those um, food delivery services, a lot of simple um, fixes to help make businesses run more effectively, to increase operational efficiencies, and to improve the ability to interact with customers, particularly now when being in a contact list environment is necessary, is often a significant gap and opportunity. So I know one of the things that uh, we've worked on, at least in Overtown with specifically black founders um, through the Overtown Connect project is that we have been working on getting dollars in the door to get businesses tech enabled, connecting them with groups like Rebrand Cities to get websites, beginning to think about doing assessments around their technical capacity or digital transformation, and then getting funders to underwrite or subsidize the cost of doing digital transformation for a lot of these businesses partnering with financial institutions to cover the cost of POS systems for for retail shops. And so those types of small fixes around tech access, um, we think a lot about digital divide and that's hugely important to address those Wi-Fi issues when it comes to education and the tech pipeline. But also when we're talking about small businesses and entrepreneurs, making sure we have equal access, not only to the technology, but the know-how and the understanding and training how to assess the opportunities or connect with the right consultative support to make sure your business is well positioned to survive challenges, particularly the uncertain um, things that we experienced most recently with this pandemic. So that's one particular um, example or anecdote that I can think of, which is a really quick fix. And I know at least here in Miami, the city of Miami and the county as well, they're really focused on how they can play a role in in helping to bridge that gap. That's amazing. That's amazing. Anyone else? You don't want to jump in on that as well, too. Well, well, I'll just add. I mean, as, as someone that's you know, I, I've, I've owned multiple businesses and advised businesses for the last twenty years. I, I think um, small businesses have always historically struggled with the difference between working in their business and working on their business, right? And when you bring up things like websites or leveraging social media, the pushback historically has always been, I don't have time for that, right? Mm -hmm. And the wonderful nexus of COVID is, I don't have time not to do that. And so um, just about a a mile from my house, there's a Latina owned bakery, 5,000 square feet, huge space. And literally overnight they were were closed. Um, In April, she did not have a website. by May, the middle of May, she had a website and people could buy product on the website and pick it up from the front door. Um, By the beginning of July, revenues were back where they were pre-COVID for the the previous year. And this was a founder that historically knew she needed to have a website, pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. Um, But once she actually embraced it um, and, and got past the initial stick point, um, it, it, it saved her business, and and coming out of COVID, it's it's positioned her to really scale um, going forward, as opposed to plodding along the way she was before. But but being able to get a founder to that point of, of understanding, I can't afford not to do this, as opposed to this is a waste of my time, or I'll find time to do it at some point. Um, I think has been really really critical for those businesses that have been able to. to to stay open and that are positioned to to grow and expand um, as we come out of COVID. You know what, I I, I go ahead, Felicia, go ahead. Yeah, I I was just gonna say, you know, COVID definitely 
uh, elevated the uh, digital divide conversation in ways that we have been sweeping it under the rug over the past few years, right? Like largely people felt like, okay, we're, we're kind of good. Like people don't need this like entry level. They need to learn how to code and they need to learn how to do other things. And like, it literally showed us in every aspect of how we live and do business, how we are affected by not taking technology infrastructure um, really serious, right? And like, what does that, that mean? For us on the, our youth training side, you know, just like a lot of organizations, we had to switch to virtual. Um, and we were able to do that seamlessly, but helping other organizations switch to virtual to still be able to work with their kids was something that um, a lot did not understand and could not serve, right? And so that's become a big part of, of the conversation. On the entrepreneurship side, and you're thinking about the access to the sheer amount of dollars that were available from a government standpoint, and so many businesses not having access to to that, um, you know, helping them, right? We launched the Side Hustle Academy that we had over 400 people go through. And our whole premise was that it was like, while you're trying to figure out PPP and PP, PPE and like all the acronyms, like you have to be able to put your own oxygen mask first on, on first, right? While you're figuring that out. And the, the kind of the makeup of people were different. Some that had lost their jobs some of, the, some of them that were on the cusp of losing their jobs, and then others that just needed to kind of figure out a way to make additional money just in case, or to kind of sustain their savings so they don't turn into an, an experience where they have a you know a financial loss or a big you know expense that they have to pay for that they, they did not foresee because the dynamics of things were so different. And so I think more than anything, for those that question was technology infrastructure important, we saw literally from healthcare to education, how much it was disrupted because we did not have things in place um, and how we can easily deploy uh, more resources when we do have a focus on what technology means for everyone uh, no matter who they are or what they need. Yeah, I would say though, it, you know, that the technology during the pandemic has really highlighted the problems for the hearing loss community because, um, you know, we're using StreamYard, Zoom, Google Meet, don't have captions that um, transfer onto the video. So Zoom only offers captions behind a paywall. Many people can't afford to pay for Zoom or don't want to pay for Zoom. Google offers captions for free, but they don't transfer. Microsoft does, it transfers. Um, StreamYard, you don't see at the bottom here anything for captions. So when captions are not built into this and they become an afterthought or after, so people with hearing loss are, I mean, this conference is amazing. They're adding the captions to it. They've thought about that. But so many videos are produced without captions and that leaves people with hearing loss out of the entire conversation, even when it includes that. And so that is really critical. And I don't really think people really think about that. And I've had multiple conversations with some of these companies and they're working on it, but things shouldn't be released unless they're fully accessible from the start. And Janice, just to add to that point, one of the things that we were able to focus on at least at Venture Cafe, we host programming every week, move the whole thing online. And even since March, 2020, we've averaged about 200 to 400 folks signing in is we launched a project called um, the Enable Project in partnership with the South Florida Disability Independence Group. And we were able to make sure that all of our publicly facing town halls had interpreters. So sign language interpreters. And I got to tell you, it wasn't that much money when we worked with elected officials we said can you cover the cost because i know it's in your budget and if there weren't elected officials involved we made sure that we got grant dollars or sponsors to cover that cost we also added and it was a minimal expense rev.com which allowed for all of the programming to be closed captioned in zoom and so what i think was um to your point a positive element of just this kind of influx to everything being online, is it forced organizations to see that there are resources and to partner with their local um, accessibility partners to really get advice and to learn how to make their programming more accessible. And things like flyers, how do we redo our flyers on our websites to make sure that they're responsible to some of those um, 
uh, challenges that people with hearing or being visually impaired might experience. And so I think that there's a positive and negative of this whole new normal of everything being online is it helps us to learn more. Well done, yeah, by the way. Awesome. Sorry, yeah, well done. <laughs> And you know what I think it does too. I think it also highlights a great opportunity for us to, this is why it's important for us to have inclusive leaders because it has to be leaders who have their ears to the ground, who are looking for opportunities. And I think what ultimately happens though, is that, is that we need these moments. We need these moments to where it forces us to have to think about stuff that we didn't have to think about because when we're all in the room, then we're not thinking about the video component in the same in the same way where now this is the only opportunity. So now as we start to think about COVID, and so I know um, so I know when COVID hit in Detroit, like we did this project called Digital Detroit. We worked with a hundred businesses and did it all virtual and worked with the city. We began to see a lot of challenges or things that were happening as it relates back to Main Street. And so what I want to do now is I want to talk about the impact of COVID to small business as it relates back to I get like this actual actual space because what I realize is that is that the affluent are they live in a totally different realm the world that they're living in is totally different than Main Street America and I and I honestly feel like I feel like Main Street is being decimated and I have conspiracy theories about this and I don't want to get too far over over on that on in that in that particular lane but I'd love to you know hear um, what are some of the things that you're seeing that are like, that are like, you know, to make you feel optimistic of how businesses and cities have been able to kind of overcome or, um, or address this challenge as it relates back to COVID and small businesses? I think cities are beginning to see that nothing is effective if it operates in a silo. And the example that I'll point to is Miami, one of our largest industries is the hospitality tourism industry. So food and beverage is huge. And so when COVID hit, um, most food and beverage um, and hospitality companies were really, really affected, particularly the ones that relied upon you actually to sit in and have a dine-in experience. And so we actually were able to host a program for growth stage F&B founders that started off with a series of online workshops. And then we actually created a bubble and did a retreat and brought in investors, um, strategic coaches, and also individual coaches and masterclass folks over the course of a weekend to help these companies think about their pivot and, and grow and expand. And things that came out of that were partnering with cities to get um, contracts so that while they weren't having retail business, they could get the government contracts to make sure that they were able to keep their restaurants open. And the other thing that we saw is local government unlocking dollars in partnership with like, you know, bids, downtown development authority, you know, here in Miami, the FIU School of Hospitality and the Greater Miami Convention and Tourist Bureaus, all of them banded together to make sure that the resources, the grants, the additional funding were aligned. And so that's at least a positive um, anecdote that I can share around F&B entrepreneurs, starting with the way that we partnered and helped to give them some wraparound support with a growth strategy retreat, as well as the various grant programs and resources that were done in collaboration, whereas pre-COVID, they might have been one-off ad hoc um, opportunities. Sounds good. Sounds good. So i like to jump to Courtney real quick. And I have, you know, and I have something that's kind of interesting. So I know like when everything kind of shut down and I looked at the NBA and I saw the NBA use, um, use like the VR and have fans in mm -hmm. there. And so it, it made me think about VR in a totally different way. And so mm -hmm. I'd be, so I'd be, so I'd be very curious to be able to see if there was anything that, um, that from a technology standpoint that like the VR was doing as it relates back to COVID. Yeah, absolutely. So we had probably our best and biggest year last year, which was is always a bizarre thing because for humanity last year was was a disaster, but for virtual reality last year really accelerated things. So, you know, you see more and more people doing like events in VR, meetings in VR, training in VR. So a great case study. Um, we built a piece a few years ago for Accenture and it was a piece about training child welfare workers and it did really well. It's, it's an incredible piece and the state of Georgia started using it 
And they had been doing in-person trainings prior to um, prior to COVID. Of course, those couldn't happen while COVID was happening. So they were like, okay, we're going to sub in this VR training and just thought it was going to be a temporary measure. Well, it was 75% cheaper than in-person trainings and just as effective. So the state of Georgia is now just like, forget it. We're not going back to in-person. We're just using VR training from now on because it works just as well and it costs the taxpayers a lot less money. And so I think that is going to be a really fundamental shift. And I do think as you know, we come out of COVID, hopefully this year, um, things will start reverting back a little bit to normal. But I also think that people have gotten used to some of this and will want to keep doing it. And that's where some of the VR technology can be really effective and helpful. So we're all on Zoom or, or different calls all day long. It's really tiring and you don't get the sense of presence. Like everyone is a floating head on the screen. And in a lot of these VR meetings and workshops, A, you can be a lot more collaborative because it does feel like you're in the same room. And B, it actually feels like you're in the same room. So uh, one of our clients, we were helping them with a VR workshop and event earlier this year or last year. And two people who were close colleagues but hadn't seen each other in months because of COVID, their avatars entered the room and immediately ran to each other and hugged. And I thought that was like a beautiful moment. And these people said it felt, even though they were in like different cities and seen each other in months, they felt like they were together because they were embodied together. So I think, you know, I, I am optimistic about how this technology can continue to grow and evolve. And even post COVID, things will have changed fundamentally. And this can help people um, maybe fill in the gaps a little bit. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. What I'm interested in, you know, I think that's a great story. Um, I look at our panelists and I think we have, we have an amazing group of panelists and I'm wondering in terms of the work that we do, how do we, um, how do we create stuff where like, I'm not just looking out for people that look like me, um, and begin to think about things from a culture standpoint and see beyond just the stuff that we have to deal with. So I'm really interested in terms of how we reach, whether it's across the aisle, like from a political standpoint. Or um, or have or have or have communities or stakeholders that don't look the same. How do we work together to make a city that works better for everybody? So I'll I'll tag Felicia um, and um, just because you know, and the reason I'm tagging you is because is because I know that you um, work in a lot of spaces in terms of working with people who are politicians. Mm -hmm. um, and work in certain communities, whether it's Overtown or other things like that. And you have to really figure out how to pull in, whether it's public private partnerships. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really interested in some of the challenges and opportunities that you see in terms of being able to make things work where like it, it works for everybody. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think there's kind of two parts to, to your, your, your question. Um, I hope that I lived in, uh, live in, a, I wish that when we started, what we were doing, I lived in a world where um, Black Tech Week or Center for Black Innovation did not exist because it was a part of the norm. Um, the resources were there that were fair and equitable so that I wouldn't have to do this concentrated effort on a very specific population that is always, like nine times out of 10, always left out of the broader scheme of things, right? Like I wish we lived in that world and unfortunately we do not. Um, so I wanna address like that, that part of it. Uh, the other part about you know working with partners, um, it it requires a collective, right? And it, re it always requires a village in so many different areas, right? And I think one of the challenges is a lot of this work is very grassroots, um, and we also need it to come top down so that we can meet in the middle and really be able to support who we're ultimately trying to to support, right? And build the city that. If you, you know, what is the, what is the quote? Like, you know, well, talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not by zip code, right? That is just a real reality in cities all across the United States, but especially, especially Miami. So it does require more of us coming together, but it also requires less lip service and it also requires less ghosting of entrepreneurs. And I would say that's probably been one of the most disheartening aspects of running Black Tech Week is we would get people, we would get brilliant people coming to our stages that oftentimes just wanted to align themselves with, hey, I'm speaking at Black Tech Week and would oftentimes make promises to Black entrepreneurs, give phone numbers, give emails, and then ghost them. Well, you're not helping anyone but yourself 
because you get to align with that for whatever your intention was. But we need more people that are being held accountable um, to disappointing Black entrepreneurs, Black tech, tech professionals, and Black communities. And I think that's a huge role that our government um, or corporate partners can play is really putting like, you know, putting action, putting dollars, putting resources, and then also showing up in the ways that are also equally needed in addition to the resources. I completely agree with you about that whole ghosting. I thought that was just something that happened in the disability community, but where people say, oh yeah, we're really into this. I, um, we need corporations to really be sincere and in, the, in and I think working in this public-private partnership you can have all the laws on the books. It's irrelevant if they're not implemented. And it's really important that we start getting companies to really work with governments and cities and have a fully diverse um, commitment. And so for people with disabilities, it, it has to also include the non-visible disabilities. Because if you only implement the physical disabilities, then other people are falling behind. And I think that's really important. And as someone who's worked with the New York City Transit and the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission to add hearing access, when you see those ear symbols, that's one of the projects that I brought to this city, to New York City. I think it's really important that, you know, all government agencies are engaging people with disabilities in a meaningful way, not as an afterthought. And, and people always complain, well, they don't have the money. And as I always say, if you figure out how to turn on the electricity and you figure out how to turn the air conditioner, disability access needs to be another line item in the budget, just like electricity and air conditioning. It's not something you do because you think it would be a nice thing. And it's never the right time. You know, many businesses now are saying, well, because of the pandemic and the business are closed, I have never gone to a meeting where people say, oh, this is the perfect time for people with disabilities to come in and we just have a extra money that we are looking to spend. It, it did happen once, but really it, it, it never ever happened. So we have to figure out how to add another line item in the budget for access. And I think also um, just jumping in on what Felicia and Janice have highlighted, Something that's important that when we take a step back and begin to work together, we forget to do, and Felicia knows this because you were part of this Miami Tech Manifesto. When we're working with other people, we can't forget that they are people and they hopefully will be able to find common ground on common values. So I think it's important that, you know, in any type of effort, it's also a relationship. So setting the stage and a foundation of the values the guiding principles and a clear vision of what you want to achieve is I think the best way to begin to look at in practice, how we work collaboratively. I know with Venture Cafe, and I'll say it briefly, you know, we've been able to attract 50,000 people, totally great. But the number that I care about most in five years, we've worked with a thousand different organizations. And what I love about that is that's representative, not just of tech, not just of innovation and not just entrepreneurship, but those are the academic institutions, those are local government, community-based organizations, organizations, um, anti-poverty organizations, tech folks, life science. You wanna make sure that everybody is part of the conversation and most people can get around basic values like inclusion, uh, making sure we have uh, gender um, inclusion, racial and ethnic uh, diversity, and making sure that we understand that what do we stand for and where do we want to be? So those values, that manifesto um, is a great practical way to begin to work with everybody. I think one thing that, that comes to mind is that, is that here, Leanne, and, and we should talk about relationships, is, um, you know, a, a lot of us have been, have had, especially for the Black folks here, have had our, our white allies reach out to us um, during June and July. What can I do? Um, and, 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 and some of it came from a really, really authentic place. Some of it came from and really uncomfortable. How do you make the uncomfortable stop? Right? I want absolution. I want to go back to feel uncomfortable again. And, 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 and one, one of the things that, that I learned back in 2016 with election Trump was we can't treat politics like the Olympics, where it's only important every four years. Right. And um, if you're not 
if, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? And so these things happen by small steps. And, and, and if we're gonna build trust, especially with communities of color, people with disabilities, other represented communities, that all starts with trust. And, and we can't build the manifesto if I don't trust you with the small things, right? And so um, when I was talking to some of these CEOs and they were talking about, oh, we wanna diversify, we wanna do something big, I would say, when was the last time you had dinner with a black person? <laughs> you know, do, do you have any people of color in, in your family, in your circle? And that's where these, these things really have to start because it has to start with trust. And if we can do the small things and, and take one step at a time there, then we can, we can you know, build the kind of fortitude and foundation that we need to do something like a manifesto that's going to really actually stick. Um, and, and it's got to have, you know, any, any sort of change has to have four legs to the stool, right? So, so one is you the awareness, it. one's uh, analysis, one's action, and then the fourth and most important, accountability. And, and I think people get really uncomfortable when you start talking about the accountability piece because they, they, they want this, uncom- this discomfort to stop. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to knee jerk to action. Um, but you got to have all four of those to really see change come instead. And you know what? Um, and I think about priorities, right? Because I think about, e- even if you think about cities, and I think about the city of Detroit, um, I I always question sometimes what's important not only to people, but to cities. Are we, are we more concerned with bike lanes? Are we more concerned with um, legislation or public policy that is aligned with a certain corporation that has a lot of financial stake in what happens in that city. And so um, I'm really interested in terms of being able to hear from you as it relates back to um, how do we address the priorities and make sure that we have voices at the table to where we can now drive this to where it's not just about the big corporations or the, or the organizations that have deep pockets and we're really getting down to working with real people that are that really make up the fabric of these cities. I think if we want to, you know, as we're beginning ready to close, but to sum up, I think it's really important that we have the stakeholders, like um, Stephen said, at the table, and a really diverse group at the table. It can't be also when the people are at the table, they can't be political hacks. We need people who really know what they're talking about, not people who gave a lot of money to whoever and and now you owe somebody. So let's have meaningful leaders at the table. And I think when you bring meaningful people who actually get stuff done at the table, they come together with a point of actually getting stuff done and they have real sincere conversations and they move the, they move the, you know, everything forward. Um, You know, the federal and state city committees that I've participated in, where there are really great engaging people, we actually affect change. And that moves the city forward. And and each time you accomplish something, you know, for example, the subway and taxi projects in New York City, when you see those ear symbols, people really didn't know that before what an induction loop um, was. And what happened was by adding the access, it raised the education and level to people may not know what it is, but they now at least understand it should be there. And so I think bringing, having really um, engaging people at the table is critical. Gotcha, gotcha. That's amazing. That's amazing. We've had some amazing conversations and um, and have had a variety of different angle and perspective. So as we come to a close, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give all of our panelists an opportunity to be able to give a quick closing thought, um, something to leave with our community um, as it relates back to this topic. And so we'll just do a round robin and whoever wants to jump in first. I'll jump in. Um, Something that I think about is um, designing intentionally for the lowest common denominator. We often focus on trickle down, but if we are designing for the folks that often are at the lower rung, then we'll have trickle up in terms of opportunities and real access to inclusive ecosystems in cities. Amazing, amazing. I will bookend that. So, uh, to, because I agree with Liam, but at the same time, you have to also start um, in the disability community to not just work on the lowest common denominator, or you will never ever um, 
work on the other issues where you get the engagement of the mainstream population. It has to really help everyone. All right, Steven. Uh, I guess what I would say is I'd go back to the analogy of, of a table. Um, and I think in the public sector, I worked for the city for seven years and it, there's giving someone a seat at the table and then there's understanding because nuance with community that communities have their own tables and, and, and sometimes, and just because you create your own table, sometimes that's, that's telling someone else that their table doesn't matter. So how do, how do you go and meet people where they're at on their terms and understand the spheres of influence that exist in different communities other than your own? Um, and that just because they're not at your table doesn't mean that the issue isn't vital and, and dear to their heart and something that they're talking about. So how do you go and meet folks where, where they're at? Amazing, amazing. Yeah, um, I, I I guess just to what, bookend this at, at the very end, and thank you guys so much for, for having us um, as a part of this conversation. I would just say, um, you know, let's shift this as specifically as we talk about um, diverse communities uh, from asset framing as opposed to, to deficit. I think we're tired of that. I think we all know what the problems are, but I think we can look at solutions much differently if we are focusing this from an asset framing standpoint. And so Travian Shorters from Be Me is a kind of the guy that coined that term. And it's really just kind of shifting our narratives to define people by their aspirations and their assets rather than their struggles and their deficits. And I think if we start doing that, we start thinking much bigger about who should be included, continuing to ask that question as we put meetings and events and programming and policy together. Um, and if we shift how we get that, I think we can be more, much more solution driven. That was amazing. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know, um, so I'm gonna close with this too. Um, I wanna see from a diversity standpoint, look more equitable. And so um, I'm not really just interested in just seeing just a different color face or someone who looks different. Um, I wanna make sure that there's equity. So whether there is um, a disability that somebody has to overcome, we need to create opportunities that address that. We need to create opportunities for women. We need to create opportunities for people of color. And there's a variety of different, and I haven't hit every single spectrum, but we wanna make sure that there's equity. So at the end of it, um, now we're driving economic uh, change in terms of the different communities and they're involved and they are a part of it. So I want to thank everyone who was on today. I, I appreciate your thoughtfulness, the, um, the vertical that you or the lane that you sit in, um, just being able to bring your thought knowledge to the table. Um, and we're really, really excited. And we hope that this conversation won't just end at the end of this particular call but it will be able to live on. All right, so this is Hodge Flemings, and I wanna thank everybody, and I wanna thank uh, you for just giving your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.